Please take your Bibles and open them up with me to the first chapter of Paul's majestic letter to the saints in Rome, also known as the letter to the Romans. As I began to pray and prepare my heart to return to the work of the Word after about two and a half months of being on break, I couldn't help but think about the charge that Paul gave to Timothy. Christian just faithfully preached 2 Timothy. It's been on my mind. But I couldn't help but think of that charge that Paul gave to young Timothy and consequently to every faithful pastor. Writing to Timothy from that Roman prison cell, knowing that his death was fast approaching, the Apostle Paul laid the following charge on his young protege. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound doctrine, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Preach the word. Preach the logos, a word that can also mean message. It's the same word that Paul used in his second letter to the Corinthians when he said that in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Preach the message he is saying. And he uses a definite article to communicate that he's referring to a certain message a particular message, a specific message. It's not preach a message or preach any message or preach whatever happens to be on your heart, young Timothy. It's the same message that the apostles were dead set on preaching and spreading in the book of Acts. Elsewhere, Paul calls this message the logos or word of the cross. He calls it the Logos of Christ. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, he calls it the Logos of truth, which he goes on to clarify as being the gospel of our salvation. So the solemn charge that rested on Timothy and that will continue to rest on every pastor and every shepherd of every local church until the end of the age is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, the word of the cross, the message of reconciliation, the gospel of our salvation in all of scripture and through all of scripture. That's the charge. That's the commission. Fail here and we fail everywhere. In the Old Testament, the prophets referred to their God-given message as the burden of Yahweh. A fascinating way to refer to God's message for the people. It signified something heavy, something weighty, something substantial, something the prophet would cast onto the people so that it weighed and rested heavily on their hearts and their minds and their consciences. Well, as we cross over into the New Testament, the burden of Yahweh that he intends for pastors to cast onto their congregations and that he intends congregations to go into the world and cast onto them is the infinitely weighty burden of the gospel. That's the task at hand. Among all the other responsibilities resting on pastors, If you forget and forsake this one, it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how much energy you exert in doing it. Your life's labor in the end will prove to be in vain. And your work, when you stand before the king of glory, who will test 
and examine the quality of your work and ministry will burn up like cheap wood, hay, and straw before his presence. Why? Because whatever you built, however many people you baptized, however many buses and Ford Transits you bought for the church, however many lives you impacted, however many people you converted by the alleged gospel that you proclaimed, however many sermons were shared on your social media, the truth is, none of it was built by the gospel, none of it was sustained by the gospel, and none of it was anchored in the gospel. A man's ministry may appear to be impressive and stately in the eyes of men, but in the eyes of a holy God and a holy heaven be regarded as absolute garbage because it's a ministry centered on and sustained by everything other than the gospel of the glory of the blessed God. When we stand before the king of angels on that climactic day, thousands will stand in utter shock when it's finally discovered that ministries who had the reputation on earth for doing the work of God will in heaven be seen as having squandered their time, their money, their resources, actually doing the work of man. We must be people who know the gospel. We must be people who love and prize and treasure the gospel, who go forth and proclaim and preach the gospel, and who build upon the foundation of the gospel in such a way that never actually loses sight of the gospel. And it's critical that we avoid one of the most common errors in the church today, assuming that everyone around us engaged in the work of the Great Commission is actually holding fast to the old biblical gospel. Imagine a team of construction workers building a bridge that will allow travelers to cross safely from one towering cliff to another. Picture yourself there working alongside of your team. And as far as you're concerned, you've ensured that the concrete that you're using is the real deal. That it's properly mixed, adequately applied to the section of the bridge that you happen to be working on. You look around and you see your teammates working just as hard, sweating just as much as you, mixing and applying their concrete to their respective sections of the bridge. Well, as you come to the end of the project, your team walks away, the yellow tape is removed, the ribbon cutting ceremony takes place, and the bridge is open to the general public. A few years pass, and you and your team reunite to look over your finished work and to find a sense of satisfaction in the work of your hands. You're there with your team watching on as cars travel in both directions across the bridge, and suddenly you hear something like thunder, and you spot a cloud of dust arising from one section of the bridge. And as the team stops what they're doing and focuses their attention on that area, you begin to see cars plummeting off the bridge and falling hundreds of feet where you can hear the sound of screaming and you can hear the sound of vehicles slamming into the dry riverbed below. Well, after the bridge is shut down and after weeks of careful investigation, it's discovered that out of your team of 35, 15 construction workers had acquired and applied a completely different type of concrete than what the engineer called for in the design. Whatever they were using, whatever they were building with, it wasn't the real deal. And their sections of the bridge eventually collapsed like kinetic sand and resulted in tragedy. As we seek to abound in the work of the Lord in the work of the Great Commission, it is absolutely critical and essential that we pause on a regular basis and ask the question, is the gospel that I'm proclaiming to my friends, my family, my co-workers, and the young disciples in my local church actually the real deal? Because if it's not, the time is coming when those you've ministered to, those you've preached the gospel and re-preached the gospel to, will travel across that gospel bridge that you laid out for them. And if 
what you gave them doesn't lead them safely to glory, but ends up crumbling and causing them to fall to their eternal misery, that is inexcusable. Absolutely inexcusable. You and I have been given all the tools, all the supplies, all the engineering specs that we need to lay out that gospel bridge for others to travel safely on and to actually reach their heavenly destination. So I think it's absolutely vital that every now and then we pause as a church to clear away the clouds of whatever confusion might be there and be reminded from the Bible just what the gospel of our salvation actually is at its very center and core. God knows that we, yes, even we as Christians, need to hear the gospel again and again and again. After all, the gospel is his gospel. It is his word. It is his logos, his message. It's vitally important that we, as the church of Jesus Christ, built upon the message of the prophets and the apostles and Jesus himself, that we hear and heed and hold fast to the gospel for at least four reasons. Number one, our salvation depends on it. Our salvation, eternal salvation, depends on it. Paul said to the Corinthians, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand and listen, by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Did you catch that? A person's eternal salvation depends on whether or not they continue holding fast to the apostolic gospel as it's laid out for us in the pages of the New Testament. Secondly, you and I need to hear and rehear the gospel again and again and hold fast to it because secondly, our participation and fruitfulness in the Great Commission depends on it. You simply cannot make or mature disciples for the glory of Christ if you aren't accurately communicating the gospel of Christ. And you can't accurately communicate the gospel if you yourself aren't entirely sure what that gospel is. You might be making converts, but you're not converting them by the gospel or to the gospel. You might be transforming lives, but let me tell you something, friend. You are not called to transform lives. You are called to give them the gospel and have the gospel transform their lives. There's a lot of people running around with New, lo- new, new, new changes in their life. They've turned a new leaf. They've become religious. They've become churchgoers. And who will ultimately end up in hell at the end of the road? Because it wasn't the gospel that attracted them. It wasn't the gospel that sustained them. And it wasn't the gospel that they loved and believed. Thirdly, we need to hear and heed and hold fast to the gospel because our perseverance to the end depends on it. Toward the end of Colossians chapter 1, Paul stated that only those who continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel, will be presented on the day of judgment as holy, blameless, and above reproach before Almighty God on that final day. History is full of examples. Your life is is full of examples, memories of people who seemed to repent and seemed to believe the gospel and seemed to come to Christ, but eventually they found themselves entangled in and hopelessly overcome again by the defilements of this world. Why? Because at some point, at some crisis, at some trial, something in their lives led them to shift from the hope of the gospel. To use the language of Hebrews chapter 2, they ceased from paying close attention to the message that they heard, and they drifted away. Fourthly, we need to hear and hold fast to the gospel, even as believers, because our strength and our stability depends on it. Paul said in his closing doxology at the end of his letter to the Romans, Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. Stop right there. God strengthens his church by the preaching of the gospel. It's so easy to overlook the truth that Paul is packing into this 
closing doxology. Paul just spent 16 chapters unpacking the glories of the gospel. And at the very end of his letter, he looks back and he commits his readers and the entire letter to the Romans to God who is able to strengthen believers according to the gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. I would submit to you that the reason so many within the church are beset with spiritual weakness and lethargy and apathy is because their hearts have ceased to be amazed and moved by the grace of God and the gospel of grace. We have got to get past the silly notion that somehow we outgrow our need to hear the preaching of the gospel or that somehow it's only unbelievers that need to hear the gospel. We have to stop viewing the gospel as the hand stamp that gets us through the doors of the kingdom where we move on to bigger and better and more intriguing realities. At the very outset of Romans, chapter 1, Paul expressed his longing to go to Rome, not to preach the gospel to the court of Nero Claudius Caesar, but to God's beloved saints, Romans 1.15. And he charged young Timothy to preach the gospel to those who, at least at the time of Paul's writing, delighted in sound teaching and had ears for the truth. He says, preach it to them. The Apostle Paul knew and he understood that the gospel is what makes a Christian. The gospel is what matures a Christian. The gospel is what sustains a Christian. And the gospel is what strengthens, sanctifies, and stabilizes a Christian for the entire course of their earthly journey. We never outgrow our need to hear and heed and hold fast to the gospel. And the beautiful thing about the command to preach the gospel is that God did not just drop down a double-sided gospel track down from heaven and say, now go forth and repeat this to yourself, repeat it to your church, and repeat it to everyone you come across. It's the perfect gospel track. No, he charged us to preach the gospel while simultaneously giving us an inexhaustible treasure of writings that he inspired. 66 books, 40 different authors, a variety of genres, written over the span of almost 2,000 years, one overarching message and one ultimate hero who is anticipated in the Old Testament and whose arrival is in the New Testament. God gives us this bountiful wealth of material and says, now go forth and preach my son. Preach the gospel. And so we preach the gospel of Christ from the writings of Moses, from the story of Joseph, from the exodus of Egypt. We preach Christ from the historical writings, the poetic writings, the prophetic writings. We preach him from the gospels. We preach him from the book of Acts. We preach him from the letters of Peter and James and John. We preach him and his gospel from that glorious triumphant book of Revelation where we see him exalted and enthroned as king of kings and lord of lords, reigning over all history and all hostility. We preach Christ and his gospel in all of scripture and through all of scripture. So with this in mind, my desire this morning is to unpack the gospel of our salvation from the pages of Paul's letter to the Romans. I've entitled this sermon, From Wrath to Glory, the Gospel According to Romans. It was the book of Romans that Augustine turned to when he heard that child singing in the garden, pick up and read. And after reading the end of Romans chapter 13, Augustine speaks of divine light filling his heart and leaving him born again. John Calvin said that when a person gains an understanding of the book of Romans, he has an open door to all the most profound treasures of scripture. Martin Luther referred to Romans as the chief part of the New Testament, stating that Romans is truly the purest gospel. He went on to say of Romans that it is worthy not only that every Christian should know it word for word by heart, but also that he should occupy himself with Romans every day as the daily bread of his soul. It's been said of John Bunyan 
that it was his study of Romans in that Bedford jail cell that inspired him to write The Pilgrim's Progress. Frederick Godet, the Swiss theologian, referred to Romans as the cathedral of Christian faith. Why is it that men who have been so mightily used by God throughout the history of the church hold Paul's letter to the Romans in such high esteem? And why should we make it our aim as the church to understand it, to mine its treasures, and to store it in our hearts? Why? Because this letter is completely saturated with the gospel. And the gospel is the power of God to save believers from the wrath of God, through the Son of God, by the grace of God, for the glory of God, in a manner totally consistent with the righteousness of God. So rather than focusing on a particular passage this morning, as is our custom here, I'd like to take you by the hand into the lush forest that we call the book of Romans and ask the all-important question, what is the gospel? What is the actual message that we are to believe in, rest in, and go forth to communicate to the world around us? So think of this as a reset morning. What is the gospel? Let's let the Bible tell us what the gospel is. And as we do that, we're going to stop and we're going to drink from six springs of water that all run into the thirst-quenching river of salvation. Use your imaginations this morning, your sanctified imaginations. And you need to pay attention because each spring will teach us something very important about the gospel according to Romans. So, take me by the hand as your tour guide this morning. As we make our way into the forest, we enter through a beautiful gate, and on that gate we read the words of Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes the Jew first and also the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So we know what we're getting into when we cross into the forest. Paul declares here in his thesis that the gospel, the message of Jesus Christ, is the power of God <laughs> that brings about salvation, rescue, deliverance for all who believe its message. And verse 17 explains how this works. Notice again, whenever someone believes the gospel message, they receive the very righteousness of God himself. That's what Paul means when he says, for in it, that is in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith. John Stott explains verse 17 like this. The righteousness of God is God's just justification of the unjust. His righteous way of pronouncing the unrighteous righteous, in which he both demonstrates his righteousness and gives righteousness to us. He has done it through Christ, the righteous one who died for the unrighteous. And he does it by faith when we put our trust in him and cry out to him for mercy. Paul's point here in this introductory statement is that through the gospel, God reveals his righteous way of righteousing the unrighteous. Many believe that that's why the word justification or justifying was invented was because it'd be awkward to say that God righteouses the ungodly. He justifies the ungodly. So right off the bat, we learn that when Paul thinks of the gospel message, the one attribute of God that shines forth in the apostles' minds is the righteousness of God. Paul doesn't say in verse 17, in the gospel, the love of God is revealed. Or in the gospel, the grace of God is revealed, even though we know that. 
that the gospel is dripping with these realities and these attributes of God. According to Paul, the good news of the gospel is about how the righteous God of the universe acts in righteousness to save unrighteous sinners by giving them a righteous standing before him. I say that again. The good news of the gospel is about how the righteous God of the universe acts in righteousness to save unrighteous sinners by giving them a righteous standing before him. The gospel explains how God can be both just and the justifier of the ungodly. That is, how he can be a righteous God and still declare unrighteous people to be righteous without becoming unrighteous himself. And from here on out, Paul masterfully unfolds this glorious good news in the rest of the letter. Well, we stop at the first spring and we learn this. According to Romans, the gospel message centers around the righteousness of God, number one, reacting in justifiable wrath. The righteousness of God reacting in justifiable wrath. Notice what Paul says beginning in verse 18 of Romans chapter 1. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Verse 16 explains that the gospel saves. Verse 17 explains how the gospel saves. And verse 18 explains what the gospel saves us from. The wrath of a righteous God. The wrath of of a just God. If we're to understand the gospel properly, we must begin where Paul begins, the reaction of a righteous God against all unrighteousness. William Farley, in his book, Gospel-Centered Parenting, was right when he wrote that without the black backdrop of our sinful nature and its consequences, God's wrath, the gospel is a big yawn. Some have made the mistake of claiming that God's wrath is one of his essential attributes. But that's not the case. God isn't wrath the same way he is love or the same way he is holy. God's wrath is his righteousness and justice in action. As Jerry Bridges wrote, God's wrath arises from his intense, settled hatred of all sin and is the tangible expression of his inflexible determination to punish sin. We might say God's wrath is his justice in action, rendering to everyone his just due, which, because of our sin, is always judgment. There is almost no reality more repulsive to modern man than the reality of God's wrath. And how hypocritical we are. We feel ourselves, we feel a burning, hot anger when we hear about heinous crimes committed against the innocent, against the helpless, against the defenseless, or anyone that we know and love. And if anyone tried to convince us that we're being too harsh or unreasonable or irrational irrational for feeling such emotions that anger would burn even hotter. And yet, when it comes to the wrath of an infinitely holy and righteous God, we despise him for it. What hypocrites. We're entitled to wrath and fury, but not him. If someone willingly sins against us, we are quick to well up with wrath. But when we willingly sin against the God of heaven, we're quick to dismiss any notion that he has any kind of wrath against us. That just goes to show our deep-rooted belief and conviction that we, the created, are more worthy of honor and respect than the holy, uncreated king of the universe. Yet in spite of, of man's hatred 
for this reality, the reality still stands. It's like going outside and closing your eyes to the midday sun. You can pretend it's not there, but you feel its effects on you. You begin to feel that sweat roll down your face. Listen to me. If you're here this morning and you are not in Christ, you can close your eyes and you can close your ears to the reality of God's wrath, but that won't change the fact, friend, that the moment you die, it'll be the only reality you know for all eternity. And at that point, there will be nothing you can do about it. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of grace. Listen how the Apostle John in the book of Revelation describes the unrepentant sinner's experience in hell. He will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his rage. And he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. And they have no rest day and night. Contrary to popular belief amongst God's enemies, the wrath of God, as Jerry puts it, is not the mere petulance of an offended deity because his commands are not obeyed. It is rather the necessary response of God to uphold his moral authority in his universe. And though God's wrath does not contain the sinful emotions associated with human wrath, it does contain a fierce intensity arising from his settled opposition to sin and his determination to punish it to the utmost. As you look down at your Bibles... Verses 18 to 20. Notice the reasons for God's wrath. Notice the reasons for God's wrath. That's why this first point, I've called it justifiable wrath. Warranted wrath. Reasonable wrath. Verses 18 to 20. Intelligent human beings, in order to live comfortably in their unrighteousness, Suppress the truth of God's existence, even though God has made his existence plain to them so as to leave them without excuse. Ever tried to, in a pool, take a beach ball and shove it to the bottom of the pool? It takes energy. It takes effort. And the Bible teaches us that that's exactly what sinful man does with the existence of God. It's there, it's obvious, and yet they spend their whole life wearing themselves out trying to push the beach ball of his existence down to the bottom of the pool. And anytime they slip, it rises to the top and splashes them in the face again. And yet they still, in their unrepentant nature, continue to try and try and try to pretend it away. That's why God is wrathful. Verse 21, another reason. Though people know that God exists and that he's there, they utterly refuse to honor him. And give thanks to him. Understand that I'm sweeping through this kind of fast today in hopes that we can cover this ground and that you can later on go and examine these things for yourself. Verse 22. Why is he wrathful? Because people claim to be wise, but they're absolute fools for rejecting the obvious. Number, verse 23. Why is he wrathful? Because people refuse to treasure the all-satisfying glory of God And they worship gods of their own making. And verse 25, why the wrath of God? Because people trade the truth of God's existence for lies and deny him the worship that he alone is worthy of. We could go on and on this morning examining the biblical reasons for the wrath of God all the way into chapter 3 of Romans. But what Paul makes crystal clear is that this wrath is deserved. It is just. It is valid. It is warranted. Because it is righteous wrath. I want you to notice something else that's very important in the text here. Notice that Romans 1.18 is not describing a future manifestation of God's wrath, but the present response of God's wrath. He does not say 
For the wrath of God will be revealed, even though we know that's true. He says the wrath of God is currently being revealed from heaven. It's currently being revealed from heaven. As John 3, verse 36 says, the wrath of God right now abides upon every unbelieving person. I know some will hear this and mock it and say things like, well, if that's true, why is my life so good? If that's true, if the wrath of God abides on me, why am I not being tormented right now? Why am I not struck down by lightning? Why isn't my world crashing down? Why am I still breathing? But look how God's wrath is currently being revealed. Verse 24, God delivered them over. Verse 26, God delivered them over. Verse 28, God delivered them over. Literally, he handed them over. To what? To fire and brimstone? No, not yet. Paul tells us that God expresses his wrath currently by handing people over to their sin. To the point where they can no longer feel its sting upon the conscience, no longer sense its poisoning of the mind, no longer recognize its power over the will, no longer fear its consequences in the end. He hands them over to the enjoyment of their sin. He hands them over to the disease that will ultimately lead to their destruction. Who would have ever imagined that one of the expressions of the wrath of Almighty God would be to never bother with someone again so that they could live happily in their rebellion against him? Who would have ever imagined that an expression of God's wrath would be to just leave people alone? And yet that's what Romans is teaching us. But that's not the only expression of God's wrath in the gospel according to Romans. As we jump to chapter 2, quickly, verse 5, we see the other expression of God's wrath. In chapter 1, Paul is addressing the Gentile world, those who do not have Bibles, they do not have the revelation of God. All they have is general revelation in the heavens, in the earth telling them that God exists. In chapter 2, Paul addresses religious hypocrites. And yet we can confidently apply verse 5 of chapter 2 to every unrepentant sinner. Paul says, but because of your hard and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. And he goes on in verses 6 and 8 through 8. God will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be, future tense, wrath and fury. Wrath now in giving people over, wrath now in eternal, wrath later in eternal torment. So we see the righteousness of God reacting in justifiable wrath now, right now as we speak, in handing people over to their sin. But we also see this wrath being reserved and stored up for a future unending storm in hell. That's the reality conveyed in the gospel according to Romans. Paul would agree with Eric Alexander, who said that the real horror of being outside of Christ is that there is no shelter from the wrath of God. We have small glimpses of what it looks like for God to pour out his wrath in the form of judgment. As in Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 18, listen to these words. God says, therefore, I will act in wrath. My eye will not spare, nor will I have pity. And though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, I will not hear them. Once that line is crossed, there's no going back. In Revelation 6, we see the world's mightiest, the stateliest, the greatest, begging for mountains to bury them in order to hide them from the face of God who sits on the throne because the day of his wrath has come. 
Psalm 88 likens being under the wrath of God to being hopelessly overwhelmed and submerged beneath a raging sea with raging waves, never able to really catch your breath. You're plummeting by wave after wave after wave. It's overwhelming. Mountains quake and hills melt before his wrath. Rocks are shattered into pieces by his wrath, Nahum chapter 1. And one day all of creation, 2 Peter chapter 3, will be devoured by the fire of his wrath. It's no wonder why the prophet Nahum asked, who can stand before his indignation and who can endure the burning of his anger? When Paul stated that he was unashamed of the gospel in Romans 1.16, that included the bad news about the wrath of a righteous God from which this same God promises to deliver us. He was not ashamed of the gospel he was not ashamed of the bad news of the gospel that made the gospel the gospel. Oftentimes we walk through life always apologizing for God's wrath as though we owe the rebel an explanation. God's not on trial. We are on trial. According to Romans... The gospel message centers, first of all, around the righteousness of God reacting in justifiable wrath. Wrath now and wrath later. Secondly, we come to the second spring. According to Romans, the gospel message also centers around the righteousness of God responding with astonishing grace. The righteousness of God responding with astonishing grace. I point you now to chapter 3, verse 21. Thank God that in light of our utter and complete hopelessness and our just deservingness of eternal wrath, the righteousness of our God, even while reacting towards some in justifiable wrath, has determined also to respond with astonishing grace. You can't yawn at this stuff. And this brings us to chapter 3 of Romans, beginning in verse 21, where the conversation goes from night to day, from darkness to light, from hopelessness to hope. And I wish I could say from wrath to grace, but I can't. Because God gave full vent to his righteous wrath. It had to be so. For God to eternally suppress the righteousness and holiness of his wrath regarding our sin and our cosmic treason and our treachery would be for him to deny his own holiness and justice and God will never do that. God did not, I repeat, he did not and he could not brush his righteousness under the rug of the universe as if his righteousness is something external to him and removable to him like a coat or a jacket, but it's not. It's an essential aspect of his character. God is righteous. He is just. He is holy. His infinite wisdom devised a way to fully execute his justice and to fully express his wrath against our sin without eternally banishing us from his presence in order to pay the penalty for our infinitely heinous crimes against his majesty. And it's here that the gospel according to Romans begins to shine with unspeakable glory and radiate with the living hope that God offers for sinners like us. After verses 19 and 20 of chapter 3, leave the mouths of all humanity shut and without any defense or excuse before the court of heaven, verse 21 appears like the rising sun over the horizon after a long night of terrifying thunderstorms. Verse 21 speaks forth, but now, oh, the butts of scripture. You were dead, Ephesians chapter one, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the sons of disobedience. You were by nature children of wrath, but God, being rich in love because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. But God. Verse 21, Romans 3, But now, 
Oh, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins and it was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Do you see what God has done here? He set forth his own son, not an angel, not a created dummy that could absorb all this. No, he set forth his own son as a propitiation for sin. Don't ignore that word. D -d Don't choose a translation that waters that verse down, waters that word down. No, you need that word in there. God put it in there. All scripture is breathed out by God. Every word of scripture is from God, including this word propitiation. Hilasterion in the Greek. The word points us back to the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies in the Old Testament where atonement was made for the people of Israel. The mercy seat was that gold plate covering the Ark of the Covenant. And it's where the high priest, once a year on the Day of Atonement, would sprinkle the blood of the innocent animal in the place of pe the people. It was a faint picture of the innocent dying in the place of the guilty and satisfying the wrath of God that justly burned against the people for their sin. And what Paul is saying here is that God did not just bring forth another animal to die in the place of his people. He brought forth his own beloved son. He gave his only son. He gave the glory of heaven. He gave his beloved son. The word propitiation can be somewhat misleading if we allow anything other than the whole counsel of God to define it for us. We tend to think of natives off in the middle of nowhere propitiating a childlike deity by offering their chickens to him in order to gain favor with him in hopes that they'll gain favor with him. No. Notice that we're not the ones offering the sacrifice. It's not us who banged at the gates of heaven and said, we want to offer your son. No, we were lost in the depths of our depravity and sin. All we like sheep had gone astray, headed to hell, and God came up with the plan to satisfy his own wrath against our sin. God offers the sacrifice of his son, and his son willingly lays down that life. No one took it from him. Have you read John 10? He says, I lay it down of my own accord. I'm not being coerced here. I'm not being pressured by my father. I delight to do my father's will. The father's will was to propitiate his own wrath, to put the sword of justice through the heart of Christ. Christ welcomed that. If it meant saving his bride. Jesus willingly lays down his life, not to cause God to show favor to us, but because God had already determined to be gracious to us. God, in order to extend his saving mercy to his enemies and eventually adopt them as his children into his family, had to deal effectively with their sin in a way that would not result in their eternal destruction. And the way in which he chose to do it was by counting and charging the sin of his people against his own sinless, fully cooperative son and killing him in our place. The glory and the gloom of Golgotha's hill. God laid the collective guilt of our sin upon the infinitely precious, sinless body of his own son on that cross. And he made him drink the full measure of the cup of his wrath that would have been poured out on his people for an endless eternity. And the son drank it all. 
every last drop. His blood stained that Roman cross and saturated the earth that we now walk on. As one theologian put it, infinite wrath moved by infinite righteousness releases infinite punishment on the infinite son who can absorb an eternal hell for all who will ever believe in three hours. It is here that he bears in his own body our sins. It is here that he has made sin. He was made sin for us who knew no sin. It is here that he is wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. It is here that he is made a curse for us. These are the three hours of the wrath of God on him. What wisdom, what grace, what reason to sing for all eternity that our king would come for us. Oh, behold the wonder of the righteousness of God responding with astonishing grace. To behold the Son of God, the radiant, visible beauty of God himself, limp and lifeless on that cross, covered in his own blood, every inch of his precious body marred and torn, is to behold the horror of sin, to behold the seriousness of God's righteousness and the severity of his holiness. You want to know how much God hates sin? Look to that marred Christ hanging on that cross without any breath. The one who gave us the breath of life now breathless on that cross for us. The cross was not just an expression of the love of God. Paul says here in Romans chapter 3 that it was the vindication of of the righteousness of God. It's how God can be both just and the justifier of all who have faith in Jesus. And that brings us to the third spring in the force of Romans where we learn that according to Romans, the gospel message also centers around the righteousness of God received by faith, received by authentic faith. The question of Romans and the question really throughout all of redemptive history has been, what can guilty sinners do to be made right with God? People talk about that all the time as they're on their deathbed. They get the news that they have cancer and they talk about, well, I need to make peace with God. That's the question. How can someone make peace with God? How can they be right with God? And the answer in one sense is you can do absolutely nothing. Unless he initiates a plan, unless he extends his mercy, unless he offers forth his hand, you can do nothing. And this brings us to the matter of authentic faith. Over and over again, Paul makes it crystal clear in the letter to the Romans that the only way to be forgiven and made right with God is by faith alone. Faith alone. You say, I thought you said there was nothing we can do. That's exactly right. Faith, saving faith, authentic faith, the faith that saves you is nothing more than an open, empty hand of someone who has come to the end of themselves, who has come to the realization that they are spiritually and eternally bankrupt before God with nothing to offer God but a sinful heart and a sinful record. Authentic, saving faith says to God, I have nothing to offer but my sin. I come only to receive your gift of everlasting righteousness without money, without tears, without price. I come only to receive. I'm, a, I'm strictly a beneficiary here. I have nothing to give in return. Everything I have to give is everything that is despicable and depraved and sinful. Have you come to that realization, friend? that the only thing that you truly own to give to God that's from you is your own sin and wickedness. Look at the end of Romans chapter 3 with me, verse 28. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Cross over into chapter 4. Verse 4, this is massive, and this is so antithetical to the way our world thinks today. Now, to the one who works, 
His wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted to him as righteousness. Every other religion in the world says work for it, work toward it, work in it, work it out, and God will accept you. The Bible comes along and says don't work for God. Don't offer your works to God. To the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith will be counted to him as righteousness. Friends, when it comes to saving faith, if you come with something, you leave with nothing. And if you come with nothing, you'll be given everything. All the riches of grace and righteousness, all the treasures of mercy and forgiveness and grace. And the faith that saves isn't simply about believing in God, but believing the God you say you believe in. It's not just about believing in God. Saving faith is believing God. Believing his word, throwing yourself upon what he has said. Friends, we can't always feel his presence, but we can always trust his word. And the faith that saves isn't simply an acknowledgement of God's existence. It's an adhering to what God has said. Look at chapter 4 and verse 3. Abraham is set forth as the pattern. Abraham believed God. Notice it doesn't say he believed in God. He believed God. God spoke. Abraham believed it. And the result? It was counted to him as righteousness. The faith that saves is a faith that simply takes God at his word. When his word declares that Christ's death and resurrection are sufficient to save all who come to him, authentic faith says, I believe him. I believe him. I'm not adding to it. I believe it. I'm not adding any work. I believe what he has said. This is the goal, by the way, of the Great Commission, to convey the gospel and to bring people to faith in Christ. It's how Romans begins. Look at, look, look at chapter 1, verse 5. Paul says, regarding his own calling and apostleship, we have received grace and apostleship for what? To bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of Christ's name among all the nations. That's how Romans begins. I'm here, he says, to bring about the obedience of faith among all the nations. And look at how Romans ends. Go to chapter 16 and verse 25. It's how it begins and it's how it ends. Paul says in Romans 16, 25, Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God. Here it is. To bring about the obedience of faith. Paul says this is why we are here. To bring about the obedience of faith. In other words, to bring about a faith that believes God and follows through by obeying God. Because faith without such obedience is dead faith. You can say you believe God. But if your life continues to wallow in the mire of sin, you're a liar. You don't believe God. There's an entire book related to that, 1 John. Anyone who claims to believe in God and have a relationship with Christ and their life remains Christless, they're liars, John says. The apostle of love says, you're lying. You're a liar. We're not talking about perfection this morning. We're talking about direction, the direction of your life. Is it Godward? Is it Christward? The gospel message centers around the righteousness of God received by authentic faith. And so I ask you this morning, do you believe in God? Do you trust him? But the more important question I ask you this morning is, do you believe God and his word? Do you believe him? Act upon it then. Repent. Flee to him for mercy. Jesus said, Whoever comes to me, I will never drive them away. 
Anyone can come. If you're thirsty, come to him. He'll never drive you away. It's the only way to be saved. Fourthly, according to Romans, the gospel message also centers around the righteousness of God restoring us into peaceful fellowship. Restoring us into peaceful fellowship. Look at chapter 5 with me now. When a sinner comes to God with authentic faith, and by authentic, I'm not talking about anything virtuous about our faith. Oh, I have authentic faith, people might say. That's not, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm just saying the real deal. What is the real deal? You know what real faith sounds like? God, I have nothing to give you. I come simply to receive. I can't offer you my repentance because even my repentance needs to be repented of. <laughs> I come to you and I believe you. And I trust you. I'm yours. Save me. Whenever, whenever anyone does that, exercises authentic, naked, bare faith in God and resolves to obey his word, they receive the very righteousness of God and are thus restored into peaceful fellowship with God. Look at Romans 5 and verse 1. Paul says, therefore, after defining what faith is, therefore, since we have been justified or righteous, declared righteous by faith, we have Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The enmity is gone. The war between you and the God of heaven is gone. It's ended. He welcomes you into his family. Verse 2, through him, Christ, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that. But we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, and Paul could mean that literally. He was alive at the time of the death of Christ. And while Paul was still actively sinning against Christ, Christ was there dying in the place of Paul. Same is true for us. Since therefore, verse 9, we have now been justified or righteous by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, I love the more than that's. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Christ reconciles us back to perfect fellowship with God. As we move on, fifthly, according to Romans, the gospel message also centers around the righteousness of God not only restoring us into fellowship, peaceful fellowship, but releasing us from damnable bondage. Releasing us from damnable bondage. And for this, we turn over to chapter 6. Chapter 6 begins with the question, what shall we say then? What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? The argument is that if God has done these glorious things for us, if he's reconciled us to himself, put, 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 put our sin away, then we can just live however we want then. Paul addresses the folly of that here. He says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. 
The gospel message is about God restoring us into fellowship with him, but also releasing us from damnable bondage, the bondage of sin. God doesn't just bring us into the family and leave us chained to our old ways. He infuses us with the very resurrection life of his son, and so we walk in newness of life. You got the same body on the outside, but internally, there's a new individual there. A new individual that, though not perfect, presses on to live and labor for the glory of God, to be satisfied for the glory, in the glory of God. The gospel is about the righteousness of God releasing us from damnable bondage. The truth is we could not free ourselves. We could not. Romans chapter 3, verse 9 says, we have already concluded that all, both Jew and Greek, are under sin. You know what that means? You know what, you know what it means to be under something? It means to be under something. Not most of our faculties are under sin, but we have this little area over here where we're not under sin's influence and we can do and do good and we can do good things. And no, no, no. Our entire man, our entire woman was under the influence and, and bondage of sin. Read Romans 6 very carefully. We were enslaved, everything about us. Our hearts were enslaved to the love of sin. Our minds were enslaved to the futile, vain, self-centered thinking that sin causes. Our wills were enslaved to sin. But when we received a right standing with God by faith, we were liberated from sin's dominion that leads to death. He releases us. He doesn't just redeem us into his family. He releases. He breaks the power of sin. He breaks the power of canceled sin. I'll let you read Roman, the rest of Romans 6 later. It's glorious what he says here. If we have been united with him in a death like his, verse 5, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Skip down to verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as weapons or instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are no longer under law, but under grace. He has set us free and the gospel message that we preach better, better assure people that if they do come, they will be released from sin's power and bondage and they will walk in newness of life and when they don't they have a father who will lovingly discipline them and get them back on track and I must say before we get into our, onto our last point that though we have been set free from sin we can identify with the apostle Paul in Romans chapter 7 that though we are set free Though we walk in newness of life, yet we find in our members, we find within us a sense of gravity that always wants to pull us back down to sin, to serve our flesh. And as we come to the end of Romans chapter 7, Paul cries out, Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And he ends by saying, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And now we come to the sixth and final spring in this forest of Romans. And we learn as we drink from this spring that according to Romans, the gospel message centers around the righteousness of God, number six, reassuring us of eternal glory. Reassuring us of eternal glory. This brings us to Romans chapter 8, the Mount Everest of the book of Romans. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 
You see, Paul began to introduce this idea of glory way back in chapter 1 when he said of human beings in verse 23 that they exchange the glory of the immortal God for idols. That's the chief crime of all humanity. The glory of God that is meant to be our prized possession, the very thing that motivates us, the very thing that anchors us in reality is the very thing we trade for idols. What is an idol? It's anything that you love more, serve more than God. He saved us from that. But we came from that nonetheless. Chapter 2, verse 9 says, There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek, but glory, glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. What is doing good in the context of Romans? Well, we know it's definitely not work-based. It's not good works. What Paul is saying here when he says that glory is reserved for everyone who does good is not that they're performing for God and God's impressed, like, wow, you're doing so good. Here, let me give you eternal glory. That's not the case. He'll cancel that out in Romans 4 and verses 4 and 5. Doing good in the context of Romans is resting by faith and repentance in the work of Christ. We come to Romans 3, 23, and what do we read about glory there? All have sinned and fall short. I really wish our English translations would do a better job here. The word is lack. All have sinned and lack the glory of God, are destitute of the glory of God, are bankrupt regarding the glory that should be ours, our prized possession. We traded it. We gave it away to pursue other things, to pursue ourselves, to be self-seeking individuals. All have sinned and lack the glory of God. But yet in Christ, Romans 5, 2, we now rejoice in hope of the glory of God, having been justified and brought into a state of righteousness and grace. And as we come into Romans chapter 8, we see that the gospel has to do with the righteousness of God, not just reacting in justifiable wrath, not just responding in astonishing grace, not just received by authentic faith, but we see it here reassuring us of eternal glory. Look at verse 18. Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. The glory that is to be revealed to us. Look at verse 19. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. The gospel reassures us of eternal glory at the end of this road. Eternal, unending, everlasting glory. Even crossing into chapter 9. Look at chapter 9 with me, verse 22. Romans 9, 22. As Paul is giving his defense of the sovereignty of God and being able to do what he wants, he says, What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? Now listen carefully. In order to make known the riches of his glory, For vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand in election, in predestination, which he has prepared beforehand for what? For glory. Even us whom he has called, not just from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. The gospel takes us from wrath to glory. Which is why Paul can say in Romans eleven thirty six, for from God and through God and to God are all things to him be glory forever. Amen. We see God reassuring us of eternal glory at the very end of Romans chapter eight. 
Let's pick it up in verse 29. Verse 28. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. Up until that point, we have a little bit of bumper sticker theology. Right, people love to put that on their bumper stickers. They love to put that on their coffee mugs. All things work together for good. Finish the sentence. All things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose, who love God. Verse 29. Here's why all things work together for good. Pay attention. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Verse 31, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Notice how God is reassuring us here in these verses as he reaches the climax of eternal glory. Verse 33, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It doesn't say that they're sinless. It just means that no one can effectively change God's mind regarding his elect, his people. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who righteouses. It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Paul throws out this challenge to all of creation. He holds the people of God behind him and hell on the other side. And he says, who? Who can bring any charge against them when God has declared them righteous. Who, among all the demons out there, the accuser himself, who will condemn them? He says, Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. More than that, who is actually seated at the right hand of God, interceding for his people. Who shall separate us from the love of God, the love of Christ? And we pick it up there. The very end. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword as it is written? For your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, not being, as, being delivered from all these things, but in all these things. Tribulation, distress, persecution, even death. In all these things, we are more than victors through him who loved us. For I am sure, certain, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you see, beloved, do you see in Romans, how we go from wrath to glory, from children of wrath to children of glory? How? How do we go from being under the wrath of a good, just, righteous God to basking forever in the glory and joy of this same God? How? The answer is in the gospel of God. The gospel, according to Romans, begins with the horror of the wrath of God and ends with the hope of the glory of God. We are not called to preach ourselves as we leave this place today. We are not called to preach our testimonies. We are not called to go forth sharing nice, cute stories in hopes that people accidentally get saved from our stupidity. We are called to preach the glory of this gospel. We are called to preach Christ. According to the book of Romans, the gospel is the power of almighty God to save believers from the wrath of God, through the Son of God, by the grace of God, for the glory of God, in a manner totally consistent with the very righteousness of God. According to Romans, the gospel message centers around the righteousness of God reacting 
in justifiable wrath, nevertheless responding with astonishing grace. It's about the righteousness of God received by authentic faith. The gospel of Romans centers around the righteousness of God, restoring us into peaceful fellowship, releasing us from damnable bondage, and reassuring us of eternal glory. Dear friend, preach it, prize it, treasure it, rest in it. God has made you right with himself through this glorious gospel, so hold fast to it. Don't shift away from it. Pay much closer attention to what you have heard, lest you drift away from it. Let your soul be stabilized by it. Let your soul be matured by it. Let, you be, let, let, let yourself be sanctified and strengthened by this glorious gospel, according to Romans.